So tell me how you fell in love with Jesus. How did you get to know Jesus? Okay, if I may say this, I am who I am because of him. I love him. I was uh, 16 years of age when I, I was born to a, a Buddhist father, a Roman Catholic mother. So I came from a mixed background, but I grew up as a Buddhist, uh, more as a Buddhist than a Christian because my mother did every Buddhist ritual in the house uh, because, you know, she was a very subservient, uh, very typically Sri Lankan wife. Uh, you know, we went to the temple, we did all the alms, and, you know, the Buddhist monks come in home, and my father had very close relationships with the temples, all that. Um, but at the age of 16, I happened to, um, um, you know, I, I, when the Lord decides, to touch you and take you, no man can stand against it. So it was, it, I don't know if it was accidental, but I went to this church called Calvary Church and I heard a pastor, Pastor Thisavira, I was only 16, um, Pastor Thisavira sing her preach. And there was an altar call after the service and something took me up and I gave my life to God. Uh, while saying that, even though I grew up in a Buddhist background, I loved my grandmother so much, and she was a very fervent Roman Catholic who would read the rosary like about 21 times a day and, you know, say her prayers, and she had a little altar where she would light the lamp. And uh, So I watched this, and I wanted to do that as well. So I also had a rosary. I used to, you know, read the rosary. I had those same prayer books that my grandmother had. And maybe it came from there. And so I wanted to go to this church because our neighbors in Colombo uh, were going to, they said, we're going to church. I said, can I also come? And I went to church, uh, heard this message, altar call. I don't know whether I understood the message, but I just walked in, altar call. I wanted to go the next week again and again and again uh, for prayer meetings, all night prayer, fasting and praying. and. There I was, and there was no turning back. Of course, uh, then I went to England. I worked in England. I studied in England. And uh, there wasn't like a charismatic evangelical church that I could find. So my pastor here kept telling me, either Anglican Baptist, you can go to any of these churches, please go. Uh, but my, my walk at that point was not so great as I was when I was here. Um, so there were like, you know, times when I had backslidden. But you know, the Lord has a way in how he picks you up puts you back on track and uh, yeah it was it was a journey that all the way and today who I am or what I am is because of it. And how do you see your role of leadership as mayor of this great city see, I fitting feel, with your faith? Yeah. I, I believe there have been many a times and I you know I'm not who am I to question God but I've questioned God many a times asking is this what you want me to do? I believe that this is my calling. He's placed me here because it's a job for me to do uh, for this city. And um, I, I strongly believe that um, each one of us uh, who are born on this earth uh, has a calling. And maybe this is my calling, uh, you know, to serve uh, the people in the marketplace, uh, serve the people as a politician, to take decisions, right decisions, uh, to bring a balance, uh, to do what is right. Um, you know, so... You've worked yeah. hard for justice for women. Yes. Tell me I'm about that. I'm a women's that. activist. Tell me about being a women's activist. Uh, because I, I felt that, you know, um, the women in this country, even up to date, I sometimes feel that I'm a second class citizen. Uh, even though we have, you know, say for an example, if you take uh, gender indicators with regards to education and health, we have really topped the list in the region. We do extremely well. We have a very high literacy rate. Uh, our primary health care system is so fantastic that our maternal mortality, infant mortality, uh, you know, every possible thing as far as health is concerned, also women, uh, life expectancy, we do extremely well. But then there are gray areas uh, in where women... Uh, we've had wage disparities when it comes to promotions, when it comes to in the decision making realm. There are very few women represented. Um, so it's a mindset and attitude. And have you felt your relationship with Jesus has been part of pulling you into that activism? Have you felt this is a, a God request? That yes, I, I, I feel that, you know, God uh, puts you in certain places to make change uh, for the betterment of people. And so I felt that I was put there to, you know, make change for the betterment of women. At the end of the day, uh, the majority of the population are women. 
uh, the, the economy is run by women, even though uh, a female labor force is very minimum uh, in comparison to the male. We have only 37.5%. Uh, but in the informal sector, you'll see a lot of women. Women go to the Middle East. A number one dollar is earned by women from the migrant woman worker. Uh, but she works under very poor conditions. You know, uh, sometimes she's, uh, she, she, she has a hard time you know, bring in that uh, dollar. And number two is the apparel industry. Back again, it's the women who serve in the apparel industry. Uh, whether it's tea, the commodities that we export, uh, in the tea industry also it's the women, but then you'll find the, the wage disparities in those mm -hmm. uh, sectors. Uh, so it's a matter of fighting for their rights, fighting to get them, whether it's in leadership. You know, we have a three-tiered political system, national, provincial, and local. Uh, the local political system had only less than 2% until 2018. Women. So we had to take affirmative action to bring in a, a, a quota uh, to put in 25% of women, and that was done by the present prime minister. That's because we fought. I was one of the women when I was in parliament who brought in a public uh, member motion asking for 30% of women. That was thrown out of parliament because my male counterparts, who are the majority, uh, in a house of 225, there are only 13 members of women, less than, you know, 6%. We are yes. one of the lowest in the world. Uh, and they didn't see the need to have women uh, in the local councils or the provincial or the national. Uh, so that's the kind of mindset we have. And, you know, you'll find that even when women contest, uh, the general public, even women don't vote for women. And so your, your perspective, you know, Christ was this great egalitarian. He's a great welcomer of woman, born through a woman. Your spiritual roots, they inspire you then, do they, for politics? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you take all the women in the Bible, from Ruth to practically Esther to everyone. So Esther was placed there for a purpose. So I, I strongly believe that uh, when there is a misbalance, and to bring balance, to do what is right, uh, the Lord would place women uh, in certain places, whether it's in the marketplace or, you know, uh, yeah, so. And how do you keep yourself spiritually fresh? Um, it's very easy. <laughs> See, if you put God first in your life uh, and if you focus on his word, uh, nothing can go wrong. I strongly believe that even when I was taking this job, I'm the first woman mayor. People said this is a man's job. This council is a tough council. Uh, it's, a, it's the largest and the oldest council. And uh, I man about 12,000 people. Uh, directly we have 9,000 working under us. Um, 16 departments, uh, 20 standing committees, 119 members. It is almost as big as you know, half of parliament, the members. How would you manage? And I've said that, you know, uh, if the Lord is with me, no man can stand against me. And uh, I abide by those principles, and I take the word, and I verbalize the word every time. Even when I go for a council meeting, I keep saying, I am the head and not the tail, and I will run this council uh, the way he wants me to run a just council. So it's, it's not easy, but um, as long as I know my strength comes from him, uh, I could uh, manage anything. Uh, in fact, um, you know, when we do politics here, it's very different. Sometimes elections, during elections, uh, people would, you know, bribe people with things. People would give their supporters alcohol to drink. And uh, since, since I'm a woman with principles, I do not uh, do things like that, and I don't even, you know, give my supporters uh, alcohol. And then they come and say, you know, you can't win an election if you don't give them alcohol. You have to, you know, do this and you have to do that. And I says, no. You know, if the Lord has decided to take me to Parliament, no man can stand against it. So I don't have to do anything ill gotten to get in there. But I lost the elections. So when I lost the election, my supporters, you know, there were people who wanted to come and set themselves on fire, uh, you, know, to, you know, in protest for not, you know, yeah, they, they were crying, they were weeping. But I had so much calmness because I knew that's probably what the Lord wanted. And so therefore, there is no point in me lamenting over it. Um, and I had so much calmness, but the people around me were very sad. 
that had lots because I was one woman who was always fighting for women's rights and uh, I also I think did a pretty good job as the uh, Minister for Child Affairs. Um, so people felt the loss. I didn't. Obviously the Lord had other plans. He wanted me to run the council so he made me two years down the line he made me the mayor of um, Colombo. So, you know, so I take comfort knowing that his plans are greater, far greater than what I uh, would, you know, humanly think that this is what I should be doing. Yeah. Madam Mayor, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for checking out 100 Huntley Street. If you were inspired by the story you heard today, subscribe to our channel and check out the thousands of other life-changing stories we've shared.